production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. A look at next year's local and state elections tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Corey Strong, head of the Shelby County Democratic Party. Thanks for being here. And good evening. Lee Mills, head of the Shelby County Republican Party. Thank you for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Along with Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. So we'll look ahead. There are, uh, we were talking a little bit before the show, many, many um, candidates and, and open offices next year. And um, as we, we begin, people begin firing up their campaigns. We've got statewide in terms of the governor. We've got the Senate race. We've got everything down to judges and so on. We'll try to get to as much as we can. We don't talk a lot of national politics on the show, but it's hard not to start with the Roy Moore um, uh, in the Alabama situation because it's a southern state and because, you know, it's gotten Democrats hope on uh, up, Republicans are saying things. So let's start there. And I'll just ask, I actually flipped a coin before the show of who I would go to the first question with just to kind of get in the, the, the season of elections. Um, for you, Lee, your, your take, does it say anything about the upcoming election season? Does it concern you? Is it just completely its own entity? No, that's its own, it's its own entity. It's, uh, if you look at Alabama, uh, Donald Trump had 1.3 million Republican voters in the 2016 election. Hillary Clinton had about 700,000. Uh, if you look at the election, this is just a referendum on a, what some would call a poor candidate. Um, <clears throat> so you had 1.3 million people vote for Donald Trump, but only 650,000 Republicans voted. So only half of the Republicans that were eligible or voted for Trump showed up to vote for Roy Moore. And you would take that as, as the, the, the failure, the allegations, the what of, of, Absolutely. Of, of Roy Moore, not something about the Republican Party or a shine of Trump on him that, that was dragging him down. No, if you look at national polls as far as Trump approval ratings, Alabama is one of the highest states yeah. that approves of Trump. Tennessee is pretty high up there, too. Um, but Al, this is just a very, very unusual thing. Um, I don't attribute it to um, Roy Moore's horse or anything, um, <laughs> just a bad candidate. And you don't know these allegations are true, whether they're not true, but they certainly played a role. Yeah. Uh, one of the Alabama.com stories says there might have been 22,000 votes for uh, write-in votes for Nick Saban. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and so, and, and that wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. But also, uh, you know, this Senator Shelby said, let's do a write-in candidate. So that played a lot into it. Yeah, the, other, the Republicans, the longtime Republican senator in the other seat in Alabama said, write in, I'm not going to vote for Roy That's Moore. correct. Yeah. And I think that played a big role. Corey, your take. I mean, you know, obviously Democrats nationally are excited. They, they see it differently than what Lee described. What, what do you all, in terms of a local uh, uh, Democratic Party and looking ahead to statewide elections, what do you take from that Alabama experience? Well, I, I tend to agree that that is a very unique situation. I mean, you have it, it, it's more of a referendum on kind of a lack of excitement about a, a particular candidate there. Um, but I think you can glean lessons from it. Um, the um, ground game, a very strong ground game, support from the National Party, which is something that on the Democratic side we're looking at heavily in the state of Tennessee. Um, it's the conversations we've had with the DNC. Um, also, a good candidate on our side, fielding good candidates. It's a lesson that we can learn in the Democratic Party. Um, the, the elected Senator uh, Jones is has a great record in civil rights, and that is something that um, the community could turn out for, particularly the black community, which um, voted in droves there. And so I think there's some lessons you can glean from it, and I think we're paying very close attention to how does that impact us. Um, and you looked at the national election, it's very correct that Donald Trump won that area, but also looking at Tennessee, or Shelby County specifically, Hillary Clinton won this area um, pretty significantly. And that was also buoyed by a predominantly black voting populace here. And so that's definitely lessons that we're looking at and the importance of going to our base as a Democratic Party. And that's something that we'll be focused on in the very near term throughout the both local and national elections next year. Yeah, and we'll explore a lot of what you both said, but let me get Bill in here. Um, yeah, so, so uh, Corey, did you have some folks who, who went to Alabama to, to work in the campaign there? Were there some... Democrats from here involved? So there there were a smattering of Democrats. I think I may have one or two people on the grassroots council that got involved, but I think 
generally it's these broader organizations, these, um, you know, the indivisibles and, and organizations like that, that have gotten involved with more of the activist organizations that we are, are, are starting to partner with, um, with this kind of new energy since last year. Right. And, and, and Lee, did you have any folks, I know phone banking is, is, is something that both party bases. We didn't do it locally. I'm mm -hmm. sure the National Party did, but that's a, it's a good point that he made. Um, this election was for the people of Alabama, and the amount of outside influence was unbelievable. Um, there's no way, I say no way, but it's a slim chance a Democrat wins in Alabama, a pro-choice Democrat wins in Alabama without Roy Moore as the candidate yeah. on the Republican side. It, it, switching to Tennessee, did, you know, does Bredesen entering, former Democratic governor um, of the state, um, a more moderate and very well liked, he had very high approval ratings when he left office, um, does it concern Republicans in the state that, that he might get more national money now because the DNC, because the state, you know, this, this federal money will say, hey, you know, we can win in the South, we've got a popular former governor, we've got a chance here. Does that all concern you? Sure, it's concerns. You're either running scared or running unopposed. But um, you, you see that I think the demographics of Tennessee have shifted. There's only really three or four large Democratic counties. Um, and so it's going to be tough for him. But the whole election comes down to voter turnout. It always comes to voter turnout. And that's a problem that we struggle with in Shelby County, both from the Democratic Party and the, and the Republican Party. Um, I tell our folks that um, we have a saying, and they could say the same thing, that Republicans who don't vote elect Democrats, and the same could be true on their side, except they have a numbers advantage in Shelby County. So it's going to be all about turnout and uh, getting good candidates to run. And your your thoughts on the governor race as well. So we've got a governor's race, um, big field of Republicans. How do you, you know, do you all take that for granted? I mean, there's a, there is a sense of complacency almost among some Democrats I know who, well, this is a Republican state. They control the state house, the state senate governorship, it's, you know, a, a Democrat's never going to win. It's just about which Republican wins the primary. Well, Democratic complacency is great for us. Um, uh, it's not good for them, but it, it's a different state than when Phil Bredesen was here. It's a red state. Um, you know, that kind of shifted, started when Al Gore ran for vice president and he didn't win his state, and it, it shifted since then. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. Court, your thoughts first on that. Let's start with the Senate race. I mean, do you all expect, I mean, having a big name candidate, a wealthy candidate who can put a lot of his own money in, in, in terms of Phil Bredesen, do you all think you'll get more federal or, you know, uh, national level Democratic money as a result both of his popularity some years ago and the win in Alabama? Oh, absolutely. So Virginia, New Jersey, cities across the country, Alabama um, is a narrative that <clears throat> involvement at the national level is important. And so and he mentioned something. Yes, there was a lot of people in Alabama, but in states where people are successful, particularly where there's um, close competitions, the tight competitions, yeah, there's going to be national money comes in, whether it's from the national parties or whether it's from, you know, this pack or that pack. I mean, the Koch brothers put a lot of money down here. I mean, that happens in every state. So there's someone weighing in because there are all lo all politics are local, right. but the stakes can be very high at the federal level. So. Um, I actually got a phone call last night from um, James Mackler, who, who who dropped out of the race. A fellow on the Democratic side. On the Democratic side, because Bredesen got in, a fellow brother is at arm, and there is a a a, a desire um, to make sure that we kind of circle the wagons and make sure that we are supporting one candidate. Um, and the decision was made by Mackler, who did a phenomenal job. Um, um, and to serve the party, serve country, and say, hey, I'm going to drop out and support this effort. And so I think that w he will bring attention. And um, we have two great candidates on the governor side as well, and Fitzhugh and Dean. And um, both of them are, are great seasoned Democrats. And I think and Dean, in his particular case, will also bring national attention. And so having th that caliber of person um, run is, is very good on our side because that's something we've had trouble with in the past few years. And, and, and before I go to Bill, one more, I mean, it turned out, you know, I mean, as you pointed out, um, as Lee mentioned, I think too, you know, Shelby County is a heavily Democratic city. It went for, uh, or the area went for um, um, Hillary in the last election, Hillary Clinton. What do you all have to do to get turnout in an off year? I mean, do you, do you see, how do you get turnout? What does that mean? Is it money? Is it people? Is it all of the above? It's, it's all of the above, but our, Focus and not having a meeting with the associate chair of uh, the DNC came in not too long ago. We did a, a labor meeting, uh, Jamie Harrison, and the conversation with him was pretty clear. 
this race is going to run through Shelby County at the at the at the state level. If if we turn out here, that has statewide impacts. We have enough kind of vo votes on the tree to shake out that it will it, it has to go through Shelby County. And so understanding that the reality is is that we have a local election prior to that. And so if we are able to be successful at a countywide level in August, then that will pay dividends in November. So if people believe you can do it and win a county mayorship or a county level offices here, then we can fold that into something and keep the momentum going into November. Right. We have 15 minutes left. Bill. Uh, Lee, uh, uh, by the same token, the Republican base outside of the city of Memphis, but within Shelby County, is the largest base, depending on turnout, of, of any single county in the state as well. So we've kind of got both of those dynamics going here inside the city and 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 outside of the city. What would you say the, 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 the state of that very significant Republican base is going into 2018? Um, Corey makes a, it's a great point. Um, they are the largest Democratic county in the state, but we're also the largest Republican county in the state, just as you said. Uh, our voters are excited. Um, they're going to turn out. Um, we do a couple things as Republicans. We always have uh, multiple candidates. So where they kind of coalesce around one candidate, uh, we kind of, um, we, we've got more people in the race. In almost every race, we'll have multiple candidates. Uh, but that helps, I believe, our turnout uh, because the, the each individual candidate will get their folks out to vote. Now, another thing that it helps us with is um, our general election is on the state primary election. So when people are voting for governor and senator, which we have a lot of candidates in, they'll be voting in our general election. And because we're at a disadvantage numbers wise, um, if 30% of our voters turn out and 20% of their voters turn out, we still lose, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to significantly increase the number of voters, which means we have to address the apathy which is rampant in both of our parties in Shelby County. And we got, before I go back to Bill, we've got a, a graphic that will show some of the dates that are coming up because there are a whole lot of, there are a lot of people running, a lot of offices open and, sure. and some key dates, but go ahead, Bill. So in, in terms of the, the county offices, we, we have a lot of Republican incumbents. We have a lot of Republican incumbents countywide who are, are term limited. Some of them are picking different offices. Some of them are, are not running for reelection. Uh, how does it change the dynamics from having a lot of open countywide positions in 2010 to being the incumbents who are, who are moving around in 2018? It changes it quite a bit, but the good news is, is when Republicans took over in 2010, Shelby County had a $1.8 billion debt, roughly $2 billion. Today, we paid down 750 to $800 million of that debt, uh, which is significant. And I think if the voters look at the record, they'll continue to elect Republicans who, who have done a good job for the last. So, Corey, can, can Democrats, uh, uh, less than a year after the reorganization of the party, can you do what Republicans did in 2010 in the county elections? I think we can, and I think we need to make it a referendum, not just on numbers and facts on a sheet of paper, but the impact on people's lives. And so if you look at, um, there's a poverty study done in 2015. Um, Shelby County, and, and by Shelby County, I mean Shelby County outside of the municipality of Memphis, is doing phenomenal as it pertains to poverty. Actually, the, a lot of the citizens there, and, and in some cases it's the white demographic there, are under the national poverty level. Um, but if you look at Memphis and Shelby County proper, we are, one of the highest counties, and depending on which study you look at, the highest county is poverty. So telling a bunch of citizens in Memphis, hey, we're doing great with the debt when majority of them are living in abject poverty, um, well, what about me? I would like some of those resources to come to us. So we're gonna make it a referendum on the lives of the people in the city. Do they have economy that work for them? Do they have a service, services that work for them? Do we have job opportunities that are meaningful? And currently right now we have a county government that's very concerned about building new roads in Eads, Tennessee and doing, you know, things at the margins as opposed to doing actual meaningful work at the core of the citizens of Shelby County, which Memphis is a big part of. And so we'll make a referendum on that. Okay. Well, uh, take exception to that. Shelby County is doing great. They have good leadership. Uh, the reason Memphis is doing bad is because Memphis has suffered for bad leadership, bad Democratic leadership for decades. Uh, so to blame this on Republicans is kind of you know, not real fair. The county's doing good because Republicans uh, have run the county for seven years. 
the city could do good if Republicans ran Memphis City, but unfortunately it's Democrats that run Memphis City, so really the blame has to be shifted inward, and I think um, that's, that's the big problem. Um, Corey and other Democrats have, have talked a lot about the 2016 state house race where Dwayne Thompson, the Democrat, uh, upset the Republican incumbent Steve McManus. Does that indicate that, that things are changing in the county outside of the city? Uh, in that district it may, but not anywhere else. Um, I'm not going to talk bad about Representative McManus, but um, I don't believe my personal opinion that he worked as hard as maybe he could have, that he spent as much money as he should have. Uh, and they got a lot of outside influence from the National Party, from the State Party. So again, the outside money and the outside mailers and the callers and the things they did, they did it right because they won. Um, I think had our side not really been, I said they were blindsided. They didn't expect as much resistance as they got and the Democrats took one from us, but I think we can take that one back. I suspect your view is going to be different. Is, is, is Dwayne Thompson's election an opening for the party in the county outside of the city? In the same way that I said we can glean lessons from Alabama, we can learn lessons from what Dwayne did there. Um, Dwayne gets some support, yeah, because he's a good candidate, but Dwayne worked his butt off. Dwayne knocked on doors. Dwayne knew that community. Dwayne understood the demographics. And I'll tell you, it's funny, you people that live in the same address, it's interesting the number of people that can say, I know the campaigns have knocked on my doors over the past 20, 30 years. Um, in Cordova, a lot of those people now know Dwayne Thompson because he's come to them consistently. So a candidate that's present and a candidate that connects with you personally and lets you know we're going to try to expand that and scale that up across the county with our good candidates. And so we're learning a lot of lessons from Dwayne. And we used to serve an executive committee together. And, and I can tell you he's a hard worker. All right. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about, about crossover. Lee, in, in, in 2010, a lot of Republicans told me that, that, that the key to success was that the Republicans had nominees who, who had crossover potential that, that some segment of Democrats could support. Is crossover, is, is crossover still the factor it was then in what I'll call the age of Trump generally? Yes. It's very important for us because, again, we're at a numbers disadvantage, right? Um, I said if 30% of our voters turn out and 20% of their voters turn out and they vote straight ticket, then we lose. Uh, so we need some of that crossover vote, and I think we'll get it. Uh, there's things that Republicans and Democrats can agree on, crime, jobs, education, those things uh, we can agree on. Uh, and I think our candidates will stand out and people will see that they're the better candidate, I hope. Does that change when you get to the state level, though, with the Senate race and, and the race for governor? No. I mean, it, yes, it does. It, it, in Shelby County, maybe, but mm -hmm. Shelby County is, is, is kind of an offset, uh, the same as Nashville and Knoxville. Uh, but statewide, no. I mean, Republicans are going to vote for Republicans and Democrats are going to vote for Democrats, and the crossover vote really doesn't matter except maybe in those few counties. And, and, and let me just con continue with, with the crossover question, because it seems to be a different dynamic uh, uh, among Democrats. And for the m reasons that Lee mentioned, Corey, uh, that, that, that Democrats have, have the advantage in, in terms of numbers. And you all had quite the discussion about crossover and who's a Democrat and who's not a Democrat in terms of who the party supports. So what's the role of crossover with your candidates in the countywide elections? A crossover is a, a symptom of a problem. If a, I had this conversation with a group of Democrats at Tresman Manor, um, and a, a woman who's been a you know a Democrat, um, I think she's 96 years old, so she's been a Democrat longer than my parents have been alive, right? Uh, and she says, um, "Yeah, I didn't know y'all's candidates. They, I, they didn't, I don't, but I know this one, and I know his parents, and he's a good person." And so that means we either don't have good candidates or we're not working hard enough to get the record of those candidates in front of our voters. That ends here. So, you know, my parents grew up picking cotton. I've, I've worked, you know, I've come from a rural area um, or my roots are, worked in the Navy for eight years. We're going to work. And so my party is kind of, they're, they're afraid. They're like, it's about to come, but we're going to work to make sure. It's not going to be a, a, a referendum on, hey, we don't know your candidates. That's not going to happen anymore. And also, I think with the national things that are going on in, in, in the state of the county, that people are, good people are getting involved 
and, and are running for office on both sides, but particularly the Democratic side. And so that gives me hope that not only when we work that we're going to be able to get to the voters, but also to give them a candidate that, that they'll be happy about. Let me ask, we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, crossover and, and um, we're talking about a referendum almost. You know, the, the, the Republicans in what was that, 2010, used the unpopularity of Obama in, among Republicans. I mean, the visceral unpopularity of Obama, specifically Obamacare. Um, to, they parlayed that into, it's, you know, statewide races, into state house, state senate, even local. Do you worry, Lee, that um, I don't think anyone questions Trump's popularity in rural Tennessee, but that among educated suburban, particularly women, at a time of the Me Too moments, you've got a president who has allegations of 15, 20 um, sexual harassment, I mean, you know, all kinds of char uh, uh, accusations, and you've got this Mueller investigation. Does, is there a drip, drip, drip with that? I don't want to necessarily debate whether those are true, but they're out there and they're talked about constantly and they're off-putting for a lot of, edu increasingly it seems, it seems, people point to educated suburban, traditionally Republican voters, just maybe they just don't turn out because of that. And does that begin to reflect on, on local, at the local level? So my job as Shelby County chairman is to take care of Shelby County. And I think you're correct. But I also say that this is the reason that I divorce myself from President Trump when we talk about local elections. Okay, he said local elections matter, that's true. And here's the point, um, I have to, my job as Republican Party chairman is to highlight our candidates, our state candidates, and try to divorce ourselves from Donald Trump. We have to do that because it's exactly the way you said. Um, there was a lot of, this was a weird presidential election, right? We had uh, Republicans voting for Democrats, Democrats voting for Republicans. It was a crazy presidential election. Um, so you're exactly right, but our job is to, is to focus on Shelby County and try to keep the national politics out of it. Do you worry that that divorce you're talking about could get so bad that you almost have to divorce yourself from the Republican brand? So instead of talking about Repub you know, David Lenore as a Republican, you talk about David Lenore. You talk about the candidates and the personality. I mean, do you worry that that effect within the next six to eight months could be that you're not just divorcing yourself from the elected president, but from the party he represents? No, I, okay. no, I don't think it's that bad. The, but, but we concentrate on our candidates. Uh, that's what we do in the Republican Party. We, and, and they have started to do that. He's, he's a good chairman, I can tell already. Uh, because in you the past, met, right? we just yeah, met, yeah, right. but, but I can tell because of the way he's talking, because Democrats have suffered for years in Shelby County because they haven't put up good candidates. It just haven't been good candidates. Um, Senator Lee Harris is a great candidate, okay? So it's going to be tough, and we're going to concentrate on our personalities and their, and their strengths and not worry about the national politics. Lee, we're throwing so many names out and I haven't, but Lee Harris, who used to be city council, is now state senator and is now in the race as a Democrat for um, a county mayor. And I should say that David Lenore, who's now the trustee, <clears throat> who I mentioned is running for, um, for county mayor as well. For you all, how much do you use, among Democrats certainly, but again among maybe moderates and independents, the, the unpopularity of Trump um, to, and when we're talking about the assessor race, or we're talking about the county mayor race. I mean, does, does Trump's name help you all? And, or do you just need to focus on issues and candidates? I don't think so. I mean, where's our base? Our base is um, in, in, in our, our black urban communities, right? And so it's hard for me to go to South Memphis. It's hard for me to go to Smoky City, Whitehaven, Frazier, and say Trump's name when, 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 when the street isn't paved when I gotta walk 20 minutes to catch a matter bus. Like, that's not playing, right? And so we have to focus on candidates and issues as well. So I agree Lee, with that 100%. Um, but also connect what we're talking about to a change in someone's life. And so that is what we're working on, and I agree with them 100%, that if we get too involved in national politics, yeah, we're concerned about health care. There's hospitals closing all over Tennessee because we don't, like, th that, that's happening, but our focus and the, and the thing that's going to convict our voters is how it's going to impact their day-to-day -day lives. Um, we have so much we didn't get to. We've got just a couple minutes left. Maybe we just get your, both your take on ranked choice voting, which is, and Bill, can you kind of give everybody who doesn't necessarily falls the way we do, yeah. what is ranked choice voting? What's the issue? And then get your guys' opinions on it. It, it. It's also called instant runoff voting. City voters approved it as a city charter amendment in 2008. Uh, it basically uh, uh, eliminates a, a separate runoff election. When you go in to vote in a single member district city council race, 
uh, you would, instead of voting for one candidate, you would mark your preferences one, two, three, or one or two, or ho however many you want to. If none of the candidates in that race get 50% plus one of the votes, then as things stand now, you would go to a separate runoff election among the top two. With ranked choice or instant runoff, uh, there would be a second vote count of the same ballots where you would take the number two votes from the lowest vote total and apply it to the other candidates. And you keep on doing that until someone gets a majority of the voters. So, yeah, with that, right now we're, we're in court, uh, the local have gone to court to get clarity because the state election commission said it wasn't possible. It's a complicated issue. I'm giving you almost no time. Your, your take on, on, on what should happen on this issue. Uh, I, I support it 100 percent. The city of the Memphis, the, the voters of the city of Memphis um, said yes. Um, and it, it, it is being done in progressive cities across the country. And I think we should move in that direction. Your take on it, just um, I'm not sure about it, but I think the state has an issue with it. I'm not sure it's legal on the state level. Which if, if they clarify, would you like to see it happen? Have to see because it's a huge expense. OK, not enough time for that issue. But thank you all for being here. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.